Apparently, I had it on the whole time I was singing. So if you thought things sounded particularly good today, <laughs> you're welcome. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Jesus Christ was crucified, he was dead, he was buried. If he stayed that way, you're dressed up, you look nice, this is a waste of time. I mean, I think you look good, take your picture, grab a cupcake on the way out, but this is a waste of time. This is futile. You are in your sins. That's the primary thing that Jesus came to do is to rescue sinners, to redeem us from our sin. And if he did not rise, he does not redeem, he does not save, you have no hope. You are in your sins sin. But if he does rise, then our faith isn't futile, and we are not in our sin. And we've gathered this morning because he does rise. He did rise, and we have hope. And we have good hope and certain hope. My, uh, my family are Carolina fans. South, South Carolina fans. We grew up, I grew up, we didn't pay any attention to sports whatsoever. We played sports. We did not watch them. We did not talk about them. I knew no one who played. I knew no scores. I knew nothing. My friends would talk about them at school. I was like, yeah, I don't know anything to what you're talking about. I was playing linebacker in high school. Somebody said something to me about Erlacher. I responded, Who? And that's a mortal sin for a white linebacker. <laughs> You're supposed to know who Brian Erlacher is. I had to go Google it later. Probably still on dial-up. I had to look it up, try to find out who this person was we were talking about. But my younger brother, when he was in middle school, he decided that this was a problem for our family and that we needed to pick a team to, to pull for. And so he decided that we should pull for the South Carolina Gamecocks. And he brought us all in on it. He chose in middle school, and he got excited about it, and he, he had us join him. And sometimes, <laughs> when everything's still and quiet, I find myself imagining what it would have been like if he had picked better. <laughs> I think it was inevitable. My older brother ended up going there. My wife went to USC. We moved here and started the church. So I think at some point it was, it was meant to be for me to be a South Carolina fan. But South Carolina fans have hope because that's all they have. <laughs> and it's, it's, we say, well, you know, maybe next year. We'll put a whole season. Well, next year. We'll get it together next year based off of absolutely nothing. <laughs> One of the things South Carolina fans will do is tell you bad players from this year that will be returning next year. This person will be back. we got 11 seniors coming back. What does that matter? They didn't do anything this year. Let's go find some new ones. Do you think our coaches are going to get them better in the offseason? Because I've never seen that happen. We'll do it. We'll do for whole seasons. We'll do for a game. You'll hear South Carolina fans say things like, all right, all we got to do is score. Stop them. Score. Stop them. Get the onside kick. Score. And we're right back in this thing. <laughs> and they mean down by three or seven or whatever. And there's no reason, have you been watching the game, to assume that we will A, score, or B, stop them. <laughs> That's not the type of hope that Christians have. It's not hopeful, wishful, good thoughts about a potential future based off of nothing. Christians have certain hope in finished work accomplished by Christ on our behalf. When we talk about hope, we don't mean, I think it'll be good later. We mean, he has accomplished this, and therefore we have rock-solid, unending, unyielding future hope. 
And that's why we've gathered this morning. Grab your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 27. We are going to look at the resurrection of Jesus. That the resurrection is real. And because it is real, everything Jesus taught, everything Jesus claimed to be, everything Jesus said he was going to do is vindicated and validated. It has a seal on it of certainty and truth. So that when he says he forgives sins, he means it. When he says that there will be hope in his name and salvation in his name, he means it. When he says he's the son of God and we'll see him in power, he means it. Because it's real. So let's pray and then we'll begin to read this text together. God, we thank you for the certain hope of the resurrection. We pray that as we read this, you would help it come alive to us, that we might see it, that you might captivate our hearts. And for those in this room who have not placed their faith in you, Lord, we pray that they would leave with a certain hope and forgiveness of sins, future salvation to reign with you for eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew chapter 27, verse 55. There were also many women there looking on from a distance, so they're watching Jesus be crucified, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him. I I love that it says that the women were there, they stayed, they didn't run off like the men, and that it specifies that when they followed him, they ministered to him. And that sounds very true. He asked the men, what are they doing? Like, we're ministering with Jesus. We're here to do some stuff. But they didn't help him. And the women came and they're like, no, we we love Jesus. We're going to serve Jesus. They ministered to Jesus. They've been ministering to him. And among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. When it was evening, this is Jesus' dead. This was Good Friday. There came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him, and Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. So Joseph of Arimathea gets the body, cleans Jesus' body. They lay Jesus' dead body in Joseph's tomb. We're told that it's a new tomb because they would have, and that it's cut in rocks. So they would have gone in these uh, limestone rocks. They would have cut out tombs and they would have shelves in there and you would bury your whole family potentially in there. Your whole household would be buried in the same tomb. We're told it's a new tomb. There was only one body in there. It was Jesus's. And they rolled a, a stone and we're told that this is a big stone, rolled a stone in front of the hole cut out in the rock. And this stone Uh, would have been basically like a millstone. It had been fairly flat, rounded, and sat in a little trench and rolled over the hole. And that was to keep grave robbers out. It was to keep animals out. And so they close the tomb. And then we're told that the Marys know where the tomb is. They've seen it. They saw him buried. That's important. The next day, that is, after the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate. And said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said while he was still alive, After three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away, and and the last fraud will be worse than the first. Oh, steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So the chief priests go and they say, hey, this guy kept telling people he was going to die and he was going to rise again. So it's possible that his disciples will steal the body and then be like, he rose, yay, and that'll be bad. He's an imposter and that'll make the, the, the last fraud worse than the first. And I want you to know that if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, they're right. He's an imposter and a fraud. He's not a good man. He's not a good moral teacher. He's an imposter and a fraud because he said that he was the son of God. He said that he could forgive sins. He said that his blood was going to be poured out as a a sacrifice and a new covenant to forgive sins for all who would believe in him. And he said he was going to rise from the grave. So if he doesn't, he's an imposter and a fraud. They're vindicated. The chief priests and the Pharisees are right. They should have killed him if he doesn't rise. And I want y'all to know that's the chief point of Christianity. 
Everything hangs on this. Does Jesus rise from the grave or not? Every once in a while, I'll be talking to somebody, and they'll be like, I don't know if I can be a Christian. I just don't, I just don't know if you can get that many animals on a boat. <laughs> and it's like, Ugh, let's not start there. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the disciples aren't like, I need to tell you some good news. The boat was real. It is real. But that's not the point to, to, to debate over first. You've got to understand, you've got to look at, did Jesus rise from the grave? Because if he did, then he's king and he's God and we obey. Then we look at the rest of it. Every once in a while people say, I don't know if I can be a Christian. There's just some stuff in there I don't agree with. Right. Of course. The Bible says we're sinners. He's God. He's going to say some stuff we don't like, you guys. That'd be like you assumed a married couple had been married for 50 years and you just thought, well, they must agree on everything. No. They just learned they had some other things more important that, that helped them overcome their disagreements. That'd be like you growing up in your house and be like, I'm not sure they're really my parents because I don't like some of their rules. <laughs> Check your birth certificate. Have they raised you since you were little? Look at some old family photos. I'm pretty sure you're their kid. That's a bad test. God doesn't think like me. I'm not sure he's real. I don't, I don't think that's a good test. The question is, did Jesus ride from the grave? And if he did, then he's king. We obey, we submit, we know he loves us, we know he's good, we know he's for our good, and we're willing to, where we disagree, understand that we're wrong, that he saves sinners, and that we obey and follow. This is the question. Is he an imposter, or did he rise? So it says this, Pilate said to them, you have a guard of soldiers, go make it as secure as you can. So they went and made the, the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. So the stone's been rolled over the hole, they go seal it. We don't know exactly how they did this, they could have done wax seals that actually had like a, an insignia in them. There's reports that it was seven wax seals. There's others that say that it was a rope. The, the scriptures don't tell us. They just tell us it was a rope that they put against the wall in some clay. But they put something on there to show this, tomb has, this door has not moved. And they set a guard. Now in my head, and I'm thinking maybe this has to do with like growing up in Sunday school, I always picture two men. That doesn't make any sense. It would have been more than two. It would have been a guard. They would have set a group there, because they were going to have to sleep, they were going to have to watch this for a couple of days. It's probably five to ten, some sort of, a, of a, an attachment with some kind of leader. They set guards around the tomb. Now, this wasn't going to be that difficult of a job. They're mostly a deterrent. They're here to keep people from stealing the body. Maybe they thought it's possible they'll try to fight us and take it, but that would, that would kind of ruin their plan, because they can't steal the body and sneak away and claim he rose if all of us have a big fight out here. But they've got guards, they've sealed the tomb, and they're guarding it. Chapter 28, now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day. So the Sabbath was Saturday. Jesus was crucified on Friday, Sabbath is Saturday, Sunday morning. Toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. But they know where it is. There's also guards there, and it's sealed. It's pretty clear which tomb was Jesus's. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for, the, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. I love that. It wasn't just an earthquake. Like, you know how someone tells you, hey, we had an earthquake earlier? And you're like, really? I did feel like maybe I shook earlier. But you don't really remember it? This was a great one. This was a serious earthquake. And the angel rolls the stone back and sits on it, which I just appreciate that that was his attitude. <laughs> rolls the stone back and it sits on it. And it says his appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. He is bright, dazzling. It's not just like sun brightness, it's like lightning brightness. He was, dare I say, striking. Y'all may not be proud of me. I'm very proud of me. <laughs> Verse 4. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. Yeah. 
seems fair. They're here to be a deterrent to fishermen and tax collectors. Not angels. He shows up, there's an earthquake, which shook him anyway. And then there's an angel who looks like lightning, who's rolled the tomb back. The thing they were supposed to do is keep that door closed. Job's already over. Like, oh, oops, he, he's already done what we were supposed to stop people from doing. And he's just sitting on the stone like what? And it says they trembled and became like dead men. They look like cartoon characters or like Don Knotts in anything you ever played in. <laughs> they see this angel, they shake. I like to imagine two of them grabbed each other. And then they just fall out. They're supposed to be tough, strong, and they were. These were, these were soldiers in the Roman army, but they see this angel is over. They just nope out <laughs> and they fall over, which is fair. Because that's not really what they were hired to do. I help manage a fireworks store twice a year, and on our busiest days, we have security guards. And they're there as a deterrent. Keep kids from pocketing our fireworks. Keep drunk people from uh, fighting in our gravel parking lot. You know, stuff like that. Help people not smoke inside the building. They're there as a deterrent. But if there's an earthquake and a shining lightning angel rips the front of the store off and steps in, I don't think our security guard's going to be like, now's my moment. (laughs) This is what they pay me for. I think he's going to be like, no. (laughs) And that's fair. I'm going to do it too. You can have all the fireworks you want. I don't know why you're here. That's what they do. They fall out. (laughs) Then it says, the angel, this is verse 5, but the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid. Which again, if you meet an angel, that's what you want to hear. You notice he doesn't say it to the guards. It's possible it's because they were unconscious. (laughs) It's possible because he came specifically to make them be afraid. He says, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he has risen as he said. Jesus Christ rose from the grave just like he said he was going to. He keeps his promises. We can hope in the certainty of the resurrection of Christ that he is not dead and buried any longer, that he is alive, and therefore when he says that he forgives sinners, he does. Come, see the place where he lay. Tells him, go look. That's why it matters. There's only one body in there. They go in. There's no bodies. Then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. So he says, come, look, he's not here anymore. Go tell his disciples. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. That is the appropriate response to the risen Christ. Worship. They come up, they fall down, they grab his feet, and they worship. And there's a few things that I think we need to point out here that are helpful. One is, Jesus had feet. Because it was common knowledge to them that ghosts don't. Y'all have seen a picture of Casper. You know it's true. (laughs) He's not an apparition. He's not a vision. He is physically, literally there. Also, There is a thing called the swoon theory of the atonement or the swoon theory of the crucifixion that Jesus had his back ripped open by whips, that he was mocked, spit on, slapped, nailed to a cross, that he was hung on a cross for several hours, stabbed in the side with a spear, and he swooned which means fainted, and that he didn't actually die. And so they wrapped him up, thought he was dead. They put him in the tomb. Three days later, 
he came out because he wasn't dead. There's some problems with that. One is, they did all the things that it takes to kill a person. It's very hard to just pass out from that, not be dead. They also were professional executioners. They knew what they were doing. They also had people that cared about him, who buried him, because they were used to having to bury, and they knew what a dead person was like. They buried him. But the other thing that I want to point out that just, if he had, if that were true, when they saw him, they would not fall down and worship him. They would have helped him. Even if he could have lasted for three days, wrapped up by himself in the tomb, enough to stay alive, which again, doesn't make any sense. But if they saw him, he would have looked terrible. They would have run to his aid. But when they see him, he is alive, gloriously, beautifully, healthy, alive, and they worship him because he has conquered death. And so we worship him. Verse 10, then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee and there they will see me. Okay, we had just been told that they went with fear and great joy. Jesus shows up and says, I'm going to take one of those emotions away. Do not be afraid. He just leaves them with great joy. That's the result of the resurrection, that you are given great joy. Some of you are here this morning, and in your approach to God, you're afraid. Maybe you haven't been in church in a while. Maybe you feel like it's Easter. I need to get back over there. Maybe you had to work yourself up and psych yourself up. Maybe you stood out in the parking lot and chain smoked three cigarettes before you came in here this morning just to get the nerve to come in here and gather with the church. And Jesus says, do not be afraid. He did not come to die, to be brutally murdered so that you could have a half-hearted, shaky salvation. He did not come and die and rise and conquer the grave so that you might approach him fearfully. He takes punishment on your behalf so that you might have great joy. Do not be afraid. It says, while they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers and said, tell people his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, that would be Pilate, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So they took the money and did as they were directed, and this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. The guards show back up and say, an angel showed up, and Jesus left. And they take counsel not to say, hey guys, maybe we were wrong about Jesus. I wonder if anybody raised their hand at the council and was like, have we thought about just like repenting? Maybe asking him to forgive us? They just are like, let's get enough money together. Let's come up with this lie. They pay them to go lie and say that his body was stolen. They specifically tell them, look, if, if the governor finds out which y'all will be very much in trouble for this, we'll cover for you. Now, that lie doesn't make a whole lot of sense because the disciples don't benefit much from pretending that Jesus rose from the grave. He was a fraud. He doesn't actually save from sin. If they went and stole his body and then just pretended he rose from the grave, the only thing they get out of it is persecution. They are beaten, murdered for 30 years. They're chased from place to place, put in prison. And then after 30 years, it gets worse. They're executed. They're tortured. All of them, not just the disciples, but the people who believe their word. They hold to this story. There's a man named Chuck Colson or Charles Colson who was Nixon's hatchet man. So President Nixon in the Watergate scandal had a, a lawyer who they called him the hatchet man. Sounds like a nice guy. <laughs> if you're not familiar with the Watergate scandal, some of you are very familiar. Some of you lived through that. Some of you don't really, you're like, oh yeah, no, I kind of remember that. Some of you are like, what? Just know it's so important that from then on, Americans have stuck gate behind everything that has ever happened. <laughs> Deflate gate. You can go look it up online. There's a fajita gate. There's a very long list of all the things that we just stuck gate behind because of Watergate. We're like, oh, it's a scandal? Stick gate next to it. But Chuck, Chuck Colson gets arrested. He was one of the first ones to be arrested. He becomes a Christian in jail or well, prison. And he says this. 
He says, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned, and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it weren't true. Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world, and they couldn't keep alive for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep alive for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. Jesus Christ literally, physically rose from the dead, and we have a literal, physical, certain, eternal hope because of it. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Three verses later, he says, But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. Faith isn't futile. You're not in your sins. We have a certain hope. When I was in high school, I took an AP English class. AP classes, you study, you take a test. If you do well enough on the test, you don't have to. Uh, you can place out of college stuff. My, my high school wasn't excellent, but we did have this class, so I took it. Some places, like, like, like 30 of these things, we had this one. I took it. I test well. I placed out of English in college. Do you know what I didn't do after I took that test? Study English ever again. <laughs> didn't have to study it in college. The work was done. It was accomplished. I was free. Well, until seminary when I had to learn how grammar works. <laughs> but that's not part of the illustration. The part of the illustration is that Jesus <laughs> accomplished this for us. We are free. You are not here to take a test. You are not here to be moral enough. You are not here to be one of the good ones. You are not here to learn from all of us how to behave well. If you are, you have chosen a bad group of people to hang out with. We want you to join a group so that you can all learn to love Jesus more, not so that you can be a good, a good morals club. We want you to repent of sin. We want you to obey. But the purpose of this is not let's come together and take the test well enough so that God will love us. It's let's come together and praise Jesus who has already taken and passed and accomplished everything for us. It is finished. He has risen. We have hope. Now, everybody in here is placing hope in something. You're looking at something and saying, if I can just have you, I'll be okay. If I can just accomplish this, I'll be okay. If I can just make enough money, if I can just have the right relationship, if my marriage can just be good, if I can just get out of this marriage, I'll be happy, I'll be free. If I can just have children, then you have children, you're like, well, if they can just behave. <laughs> and then you're like, if they can just move out. <laughs> But we pick something to say, if I can just have this, if this will just work. We, pay, we say, okay, if I can just make enough money. And then you find out that people on the internet can just decide to buy certain stocks and mess everything up. If I can just have enough money, if I can just control this right. And then there's a man who's just doing his job and then he realizes he left his garage door open. So he takes his cargo ship and does a three-point turn. And he gets stuck. And the supply chain for the whole world is messed up. <laughs> These things are not certain. They are not controllable. You're hoping in something that is... Look, the truth is, and I hate to break it to some of you, we're all Gamecock fans in something. We've all picked something that we're just wishfully thinking it'll get better one day. That sometime it's going to finally work. And the reality is, even if we get it, how long does it have to last? Does it have to stay stable? Can you peak and stop? Or does it have to keep getting better over time? Can you sustain it? Some of you have picked something that's always out in front of you, but the reality is if you ever get it, you'll realize that now you've got to keep it. You do. Some of you right now are running from your past decisions, just waiting for your past mistakes to catch up with you. This is uncertain hope that is to be accomplished by you and kept by you. So I want us to look, I want you to think about what is it that you keep placing your hope in, that it'll fix you, that it'll save you. I want us to look at 1 Peter 1, 3, 4, and 5. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That our hope, if you are in Christ, is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Not through your good works, not through your intelligence, not through your good behavior in the past or your ability to promise to be better in the future. Not through you. Praise Jesus, not through you. Praise Jesus, not through me. It's not even that he gives us a clean slate and says, keep it together. He takes it and he keeps it, which is good. I don't want it back. I can't do it. (laughs) Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, verse 4, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, you, who, by God's power, are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Now look at that. What else passes that test? Does your, is your money imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept eternally for you? Is it guarded by God's power? Is it ready to be revealed? Is your health and good looks and muscles, <laughs> are they imperishable? Undefiled, unfading? Are they kept for you eternally? Are they guarded by God's power? Is your marriage, your relationships, your children, your good morals, your ability to not be found out? See, a lot of us start off on the, I'm going to behave really well. And then that turns into, I'm going to hide really well. And I'm going to behave really well in the future. But it's not imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you. It's not guarded by God's power. If your hope isn't in Christ, may I suggest you get a better hope. If your hope isn't sealed, if your hope isn't certain, if your hope doesn't make you free, if your hope does not remove fear and leave you with joy, may I suggest you get a better hope. And may I tell you that you can find it in Christ and you can find it in Christ right now. That he can save to the uttermost all those who will call on him for salvation. That we come to him in repentance, meaning that all you bring is the stuff that makes you insufficient to save yourself. You come with your sin. That's what qualifies you for salvation is that you need it. And you come and you say, Lord, I can't save myself. I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. I can't keep it. I can't maintain it. By the grace of God, save me. And he does. He loves us enough to die for our sins and he rises so that we might have certain hope that we come to him in faith. We trust that he does it. We give him praise and glory. That's why we gather to worship his name because he's the one who redeems to praise his name because he's the one who saves. And if your hope isn't this certain, might I suggest that you place your faith in Jesus and you get your fear taken away, you get it replaced with great joy, and you have a certain hope. The band's going to come back up and we're going to praise Jesus. And Christians in this room, we're going to get loud and we're going to celebrate because it's not up to us. It's not left on our shoulders. And if you have not placed your faith in Christ, you can I know that you're qualified. I know that you're qualified because all you need is sin, all you need is shortcoming, all you need is weakness, that you can come to him right now, and I know that he has qualified us through his finished work on the cross, so all you have to do is say, please forgive me of my sins, change me, help me to follow you, and he will. Don't hesitate. We have this tendency to fight this. Don't fight this. Lay your fear down. Leave with joy. Be redeemed by Christ. Let's pray. God, we thank you that we have a certain hope through the resurrection of Christ. That we are guarded by your power, not ours. And Lord, for the person in here who's had these moments right now where the Holy Spirit is pulling on them to believe pressing on them and saying, let this go, turn from this, trust in me. Lord, may you break them so that they will not fight you any longer. By your grace, will you claim them? May they lay their sin down and ask for salvation to the one who loves and freely gives forgiveness without regret, hope that is certain 
May you take fear away and leave in its wake great joy accomplished by the finished work of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.